So this morning we're going to start a new series, a series that's going to last us seven weeks. And it's a series that's essentially based on the question of, so now what? And I thought of this as we came through Easter this past week and we, we, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus and just the reality of that. And, and I found myself thinking, for those disciples, those, those first followers of Jesus, after the, just the emotions that they would have experienced and first uh, the, the heartbreaking loss of seeing Jesus being crucified and then the uncertainty and the fear and just the doubt and the worry as to what was going to happen next, suddenly being changed again on the roller coaster ride of emotions to this great hope and, and this sense of joy and celebration in seeing Jesus having been risen and, and standing before them, I wonder if they asked the question, so, so now what? We, Jesus was with them for about another month and a half, and, and, and they're spending time together, and, and maybe the disciples are thinking, okay, so this is all great, and, and so Jesus, you're going to stay with us, and, but, but what exactly are we supposed to be doing? And we see at the very end of the Gospels, we see at the very beginning of the book of Acts, which is kind of the, the start of the early church and just kind of their history, we're reminded of Jesus telling his disciples, here's the plan. All of you, all about 120 of you at the very beginning, are now going to become my witnesses, are, are now going to become my messengers. You are going to start building with my spirit the kingdom of God. And so you're going to go out, you're going to go into communities, you're going to go into neighborhoods, you're going to go into villages, you're going to go into temple, and, and, and you are going to begin bringing this good news, telling people about me. And the amazing thing about that reality is nothing's changed, is that God still desires that we will be his messengers and his witnesses. Because perhaps you found yourself in a situation or in a place when, when you first came to faith, when you first came to a place of saying, yes, I, I want to follow Jesus with my life. Or maybe you're in a situation where you've had this very um, spiritual experience and, and God has seemed very real to you. And then you ask the question, okay, so now what? What, what, what does this look like? What, is this, what does this start to, to, to become a reality in my life as I live out my faith? And so we're going to unpack that a little bit over the next seven weeks and begin to see what Jesus really desires from us, I believe, is that in being witnesses, we essentially live out the reality of faith in the day-to-day. -day. That, that suddenly our life becomes our witness and our testimony to the reality of Jesus at work in us. Perhaps you've, you've, you've heard these sayings before. They're, they're not original with me. They're not new. When, when some people say, you know what? Your life may be the only Bible that some people ever read. Or, 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 or we are billboards for Jesus. The reality that oftentimes the message that people get about Jesus, either good or bad, comes as a reflection of our life. I'm sure we're probably divided on this. Um, but we all understand the concept of window shopping, right? You're, you're with me? That's not a new term to any of you. I see blank stares, people. I'm starting to worry here. <laughs> window shopping. So just imagine for a moment that you know, some people love it, some people can't stand it, some people worry when their kids are walking through malls and they see all these different things. But, but imagine you're walking downtown Paris, and it's a beautiful day, nice sunny day. We haven't had many of those. And you think, okay, I'm going to go out for a stroll. And you go downtown Paris, and you're not looking to go into any stores or any shops. You, you don't really need to buy anything. You don't really want anything. But as you're walking down the street, suddenly you pass a store, and you see something. Maybe it's a sign. Maybe it's an article of clothing. Maybe it's a new Lego set. I don't know, whatever it may be. And it catches your eye. And suddenly you think, huh, I'm kind of intrigued. I'm kind of interested. I, I had no real intention of going in that store. But now I think I will. And so now you go into the store and, and you begin to look and, and browse and maybe ask more questions and, and perhaps come to a place where you actually end up buying something that you really didn't think you were going to at the start of the day. 
And it's because of what you saw in the window that you were intrigued to go in. Now the opposite is also true. There are certain stores that you walk by and based upon what they see displayed in the window, you may think, that is of no interest of me. I, I, I will never go in that store. And it's all based upon what people see in that window. The more and more I think about that, the more and more I think about just how we become witnesses for Jesus, I, I, I often realize that many people in this world, many people in our communities, are window shopping for Jesus. And so the question that we want to deal with for the next seven weeks is what's on display in your life? When, when people see the way in which we live, are they intrigued? Are they, are they drawn to know more about why you live that specific way? And then suddenly doors and opportunities begin to open, perhaps, where you can start to tell them about the reality of Jesus in your life. I am struck by the number of situations that often happen in a week where, where I have an opportunity based on my actions and my decisions I can either be on display for Jesus in a positive way or a negative way. One, one cropped up here this morning. Uh, I'm sure you noticed on the south entrance of the church, you, you couldn't get in for obvious reasons because they're, they're re-roofing our neighbor's house. Not, not a great day to re-roof your house when you live next to the church and we kind of need to get into the church, right? And, and, so, and so I saw them and I saw them up on the roof and, and, I, and I saw they closed off the entrance and so my initial reaction is like, what, what are you doing? What, we need to get into the church. This is going to be an inconvenience for us. And then I thought, oh shoot, I'm talking about being on display for Jesus. And do I really want to display anger and annoyance and frustration? And so I just simply walked out and had a conversation with them. And they, they were very apologetic, and they just asked, you know, would it be okay? Would you mind? I, I know it's an inconvenience. And I thought, here's an opportunity. Here's an opportunity to be on display for Jesus in a positive way. Now, now, now do I think they're going to show up this morning? No, they're, they're, they're working. N next week, I, I don't know, probably not. But, but the point is, is the choice of my actions, the, the choice of my behavior, does not only reflect upon me, but upon the reality of Jesus. And I was totally hooked because when I walked out, he says, oh, are you the minister? I'm like, oh, gosh, now i got to be kind. Because <laughs> if I was unkind, they'd also look poorly on you. Why do people come and listen to this guy talk on a Sunday morning? And so it's just to be mindful and I'm sure for those early followers of Jesus, they, they needed to be mindful of the reality of, of their life was on display for others. And as we'll begin to see as we unpack this series, we'll start to see that people were drawn to Jesus because of the reality of God at work in their life. And so I boil it down to seven. It's not original with me. And we're going to look at seven virtues. You're not going to find this list of seven rattled off in the Bible as one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We're kind of pulling from different places. And, 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 and it's really originally with the early church fathers, this, the early church movement, where they talked about these seven virtues that, that often should become a reality in our life. If, if Jesus is really at work, we'll begin to see these virtues cropping up more and more in our day-to-day -day living. You may have heard this on, on, a, on a different side of things when people talk about the seven deadly sins, right? You know, wrath, gluttony, sloth, envy. We're going to flip the other side of that and look at the positive reality because those are the arch rivals to these virtues. Those are like the nemesis of what we want to be talking about. And so for the next seven weeks... We're just going to continue to unpack this question of what's on display in your life. And so the first place we're going to land is perhaps an important place to go. And that is the virtue of humility. Now humility 
is one of those virtues, one of those realities that, that we appreciate so much in others. But it seems so elusive for me, for us. We, Tim Keller, a pastor in New York City, says, you know, humility is so shy that even the minute you start talking about it, it wants to disappear. I was thinking the other day, humility is kind of like trying to make snowballs out of jello, right? You, you, you know it's there, you know you want to do it, you know what you want to do, but it's, the harder you try, the harder you try, it just seems to slip through your fingers. And I believe the reality is because humility is a byproduct of something greater. That if we just simply focus upon becoming more humble, it's actually a misstep in our life. And so how does this start to work out in our life? I want to jump into one, one passage in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, where we be, see a, a situation that will help us unpack a little bit as to how we can begin to see humility become a little bit more of a reality in our life. And we're going to focus on a couple details because there's, there, the, the, there's, there's a fairly telling conversation that takes place. To kind of jump us up to speed, it's very early on in, in the Bible. It's the 11th chapter in Genesis. And what has just happened is God has created Adam and Eve, and, 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 and he, has, he has given them control. But because of sin, because of a lack of humility, because of pride, Adam and Eve choose to go their own way. And sin begins to enter this world. And, and over time, we start to see just how destructive it becomes. And so God gets to a place where he says, I can bear this no longer. And he sends the rains, and he floods the entire earth. And only Noah and his family were found righteous, were, were, were seen as individuals desiring to follow after God. And so God begins to rebuild through this one family. And it's through Noah that God makes this promise, this, this, this covenant, this, this commitment. He says, Noah, I want you to be fruitful and to fill the earth. I want you to scatter as we begin to rebuild this place. And then two chapters later, we land on this story in Genesis. I'm reading from Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 to 9. May God bless this reading from his word. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, Come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves, and otherwise we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, If, as one people, speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language, so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. And so perhaps you're, you're familiar with that story, you're, you're familiar with uh, the Tower of Babel. And in some ways, when you read that story, the tower can actually be somewhat distracting. Because we, we see this dialogue going on where these individuals, this community, decides we're going to build a city. And then we're going to build a massive tower that is going to reach to the heavens. We're, we're going to try to get to God. Right? And then God sees what's happening and is like, this is not a good idea, so I'm going to go down and I'm going to confuse their language so that the building will stop. And there may be the temptation to think, is it, is it really about this, this tower, about this building? I mean, did God really think that they could build high enough to reach him? Like, 
is that what God is worried about? On the flip side, would the people be naive enough to think that they could build a tower and, and reach him? And, and, and so you can kind of quickly kind of run through this and think, okay, let's just keep reading and, and, and move on. But, but there's something greater going on. And I would suggest that the issue isn't so much in the tower, but rather in the motivation behind the tower, the desire in order to build. Remember, right before this, God told Noah, I want you to be fruitful, and I want you to fill this whole earth. I don't want you to stay put. I want you to go out, and I want you to begin to scatter. Because in the building of this tower, I see the, the issues beginning to creep up. When the townsfolk said, let us go and build a tower so that we can make a name for ourselves. You see, the tower suddenly became all about them. All about their initiative. All about getting honor in their name. And I wonder if God's looking at them and thinking, what? When did this suddenly become all about you? Where, where is your focus upon me? You see, the subtlety of pride is that it can take things in our life and put an unfair focus upon them. We, we can begin doing things in our life that, that suddenly may start out small, may start out subtle, and, 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 and from a stand back you may think, is there really anything wrong with this in my life? But you have to step back and ask the question, who's the focus upon? Am I building these towers? Am I doing these things in my life so that I get the focus? Or is the focus upon God? Because oftentimes what happens, and we see this in the Tower of Babel, is when our focus is taken off of God and put on of ourselves, a secondary problem occurs. We begin to fail to do the things that God wants us to do. God, God was very clear. He, he didn't give a long list to Noah. He said, be fruitful and fill the earth. Scatter. Don't sit still. And what did the people do in Babel? They said, we're going to build a tower we're going to be awesome so that we never have to leave this place. We can just stay put. And they began to fail to do the things that God wanted them to do. They, they failed to follow in the ways that God wanted them. And so what did God do? He, he makes that comment and says, listen, if they're all speaking the same language and they're all going in this direction, it's going to become even more destructive. So I'm going to go down there, and I'm going to mess things up. And so just imagine, just like, sometimes we read through Scripture too quickly, and we think, oh yeah, the Tower of Babel built a tall tower, everyone's speaking the same language, and then the next day they're not speaking the same language, chapter 12, right? Can you imagine if you were on the job site? You know? It's like, hey, Jimmy, pass me that, I don't know what they call that, mallet to bang this rock into place and hey Jimmy help me and, and Jimmy's talking and we're, they're having a good conversation one day and then the next day Tuesday comes along and Jimmy doesn't know what the heck you're saying and you're looking at each other like I don't know what you guys are like at when you play charades but charades is a tough game right I can't even get people to name like books and movies after like sounds like this if you're trying to build something that would be confusing and so imagine you were there and suddenly your plans go completely awry. They would have had to refocus. They would have had to begin to, to, to start doing something else. And guess what happens? They begin to scatter. They begin to go in the way that God desires them to go. You see, pride is destructive because it can be subtle. It can be hard to detect but the questions we need to begin to ask is the things I'm doing in my life, the towers I'm building, are they focused upon God or upon me? And are the things that I'm doing in my life becoming such a distraction that I fail 
to follow in the ways of God. I realize more and more in my life just how important humility is because I have plans, I have dreams, I have ideas, I have stuff I want to do. But is that God's plan for my life? Am, am I humble enough to give up a tower that would make my name so great so that people would know who Joel was so that I can follow him? You see, I love humility in others, but it's so elusive in my life because of the situations, because of the towers, because of, of the things that we want to do to make ourselves a somebody. And so how do we do it? I, I almost hesitate in, in even attempting to, to answer that question because, again, the more we focus on humility, uh, the harder it seems to become. And so I want to take a slightly different angle on it and actually jump ahead just one chapter in the Bible to chapter 12. Because there we begin to see a model of how humility begins to be displayed in our lives. And it's a story of God making a commitment, a covenant with Abram. More well known as Abraham. God, God changed his name later on. But it's right there with, with Abram. And it, we don't have time this morning, but if, if you want to do some extra reading here this week, read, read chapter 11 in Genesis again, and then read chapter 12, and you see a lot of the same language is being used. And remember, the people of Babel said, we're going to build a tower so we can make our name great, so that we will be a somebody. And what is God's promise to Abraham? Follow in my ways, and I will make your name great. I will make a great nation. I will make you a somebody. And Abram, here's the deal. In order for all of this to work, you need to understand that I'm going to bless you not just for your sake and your benefit, but for the benefit of others. You will be a blessing to others. And so what do we begin to see in the life of Abram? To begin to see humility becoming a reality in our life. Our focus needs to be taken off of ourself and placed back on God. C.S. Lewis says, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's, it's not about becoming a, a, a doormat and saying, I, I, I'm, I'm a nobody. God doesn't want that in our life. It's just thinking about yourself less often. It's about taking the focus off of yourself and putting it back upon God and back upon him. It's in recognizing that our attention is going to be drawn to him. The week heading into Easter, if you were with us, there was these amazing paintings that were, were put up every day, and people had a chance to come in and view. And the painting that came on Good Friday with Jesus on the cross, at the end of the service, as we have focused upon Jesus, there was this incredible picture that was taken, that was then sent to me. And I think this picture summarizes what I'm trying to say perhaps better than I can. I just want to pull it up on the screen. What an image of humility. What an image of just allowing Jesus to become the focus of our life again. You see, Abram was willing to trust in God, was willing to put his focus on God, was willing to humble himself because God asked him to give up your dreams of staying in your country, of building a name in your land. I want you to leave your land. I want you to leave your family. I want you to follow me. And Abram did. And those are the actions of one who's focused on God and willing to follow in his ways. Because I realize in my life, and, and perhaps you've noticed this as well, is that when we fail to focus upon God, humility is not only elusive, but pride can begin to creep in. 
Even on things on the outside that may look very good and may look incredibly humble to others, deep down inside, we know our perspective is slightly off. I think of my own work here in this church. I think of the ministries that we're engaged in and the things that we are doing. I have to pull back and ask myself the question, Am I doing the things that I'm doing to make a name for myself? Or am I willing and wanting to build the kingdom of God? Because sometimes I have to let go of the things that, that, that maybe I wanted to do in order to follow the ways of God. I have to step back at times in my life and, and ask, you know, am I doing the things in my own spiritual life for for my relationship with God, or, or just to look spiritual and humble to others. Did you ever notice the people that Jesus went after, the people that Jesus went after the most in his ministry? Pharisees, the, the religious folk, the people who were doing good. You see, what I realize in the reality of the Pharisees is that in order to pursue God, we focus on grace and not just about being good. Because when we focus upon just being good, we, we, we begin to, to create this, this shell of spirituality that is lacking on the inside. Because what did the Pharisees do? They did a lot of good things for God. They they prayed in the public square with, with words that other people probably didn't even understand. They, they gave generous amounts. They, they fasted in such a way that everyone knew that they were fasting and being spiritual and being humble. And Jesus saw it and said, that's not what I'm looking for. When you fast, do it on a different day. And heaven forbid, wash your face, brush your hair, comb your Brush your teeth, comb your hair. Don't let people know that you're fasting. When, when you give, don't, don't, don't let one hand know what the other hand is doing. When you pray, don't, don't do it in the public square. Go, go home and pray. If this is really about your relationship with me, then, then don't put it on display for the world to see. You take a step back. And begin asking yourself the question, is my own spiritual life becoming a tower that I am building to make a name for myself? Because what you start to see is when you put your focus back onto God, you start to see that suddenly life is not all about what I'm doing. But it's about meeting the needs of others. When Jesus was asked, what is the most important thing you can do? He says, love God and love others. And that, in a nutshell, is the reality of how humility begins to work out. That as we focus more upon God, we will then focus more upon others. Going back to the story of Abram, not only was he willing to focus upon God, but, but he was also willing to set aside his rights for the sake of others. Because God upheld his side of the deal. Abram and his family were, were being blessed by God. And they had tons and tons of livestock. So much so that we're told that, that Abram and, and his cousin, or his nephew Lot, had too many livestock that they couldn't graze together anymore. And there was some fighting amongst the, the, the herdsmen. And so they, they come to Abram a lot and say, we need to figure this out. And so Abram says, you know what? I need to go left, you need to go right. Or you need to go north, I need to go south. We, we need to scatter, we need to separate. Now Abram was the oldest. He was the un uncle. And so he had the right to choose first. But what does he do? He says, Lot, you choose. If you go right, I'll go left. If you go north, I'll go south. Your call. And one area looked a whole lot better than the other. But Abram, because his focus was upon God, was willing to give up his right for the sake of another. And to truly follow in the ways that God wanted him 
to play out. As I think of that question in my life, what's on display? I take a step back and begin to see what image, what, what reality do people see in my life? Do they see a reality where I'm trying to pursue things for my sake or for God's? Do, do they see the reality of, of Joel trying to put his name out there ahead of others or willing to take a step back? This past Christmas, uh, you may remember a, a gentleman came and spoke. Uh, his name was Chuck Congram. He's a retired minister, Presbyterian minister uh, from down Windsor Way. And a lot of you probably don't know the, the history of Chuck because uh, he wouldn't, he would never say it and he would probably yell at me for telling you, but anyways, I'm telling you. He started at a church a number of years ago at the start of his ministry and there was probably a handful of people, 25, 30 people. And in the course of the ministry that he was a part of, they went through five different building plans, five different buildings, and the people, the, the bips, you know, the butts in pews on a Sunday morning was over a thousand on a Sunday morning. He's involved in so many different ministries and so many different things, and so I called him up on a whim and said, hey Chuck, would you like to come and, and, and share and, and, and talk at our church? And his response was, if I can be of help to you, Joel, I would love to come. And it's like I almost put the words in his mouth. I'm like, but Chuck, I mean, you're, you're, you're a busy guy. I know you're a busy guy. He says, no, no, no. If I can be of help to you, I would love to come. And I'm like, I want that on display in my life. And I see the reality in Chuck is his willingness to focus upon God and to serve others. And so this is the first step an opportunity for us to, to begin to look at our own lives and to begin to see the reality of that we are called to be witnesses for Jesus. And so look at the, the towers we may be building in our life and ask ourselves, if people are shopping for Jesus, if people are looking for Jesus, what message will they get from me. Please stand as we sing together.